today, Colorado's top Senate Democrat is breaking with his party over red flag gun control legislation. Now, the last time Democrats passed gun control, a state senator from Pueblo was recalled. Senate President Leroy Garcia is not about to let that happen to him. He now says he'll vote no. That leaves Democrats with a one vote margin to pass the bill without a single Republican in support. It's expected to happen by the end of the week. But then what? Half of Colorado's counties, mostly rural, have said they will not enforce a law to seize people's guns if judges declare those gun owners to be a danger. Sheriffs are well aware that they risk being held in contempt of court if they refuse a judge's order. Democratic Governor Jared Polis seemed to back down today, saying that sheriffs ignoring these orders, well, that's just local law enforcement setting its own priorities. Law enforcement agencies are executive agencies. Everyone has to follow the law. Uh, I am one. I will follow the law. Even laws I personally disagree with, we follow those laws. I know our sheriffs have the highest professional standards and would do so as well. Um, but yes, law enforcement agencies also have discretion around prioritization of resources. For a little while now, we've been trying to get a straight answer from Governor Polis on whether he would use statewide law enforcement like the State Patrol or CBI to go in if local sheriffs will not to seize guns. He was asked again today, and he gave a word salad that did not answer the question. Pueblo will not be joining the list of counties and cities refusing to enforce red flag gun control if that becomes law. City Councilman Mark Aliff this introduced a, resolution, a resolution to do that last night, but then the man was left hanging. He could not get anyone else to second his suggestion. The people in the audience liked it, but it all sounds very awkward. But listen, politics can be sick business. Consider the contagion going through the state capitol right now. Democrats have contracted Russian fever, the burning desire to push through legislation as fast as possible. And Republicans have a bad case of the stalls, doing anything they can to make lawmaking go slow. House Republicans are now using the Senate Republican tactic of asking for bills to be read out loud in full. So here's how House Democrats responded. I move that House Bill 1232 be read at length. Mr. Randall, please read House Bill 1232 at length. Second reading unamended March 25th, 2019 House Sponsorship Gonzalez Gutierrez and Catlin, Senate Sponsorship Quorum and Rodriguez, shading denotes House Amendment. Hey, it's the return of the robots. But they're reading at a slower speed than the ones that got Senate Democrats slapped down by a judge who ruled that bills must be read out loud at an understandable speed. So it is March. March, and you are already seeing political ads. But Denver's electing its next mayor in May, and after two terms in office, Mayor Michael Hancock has the campaign cash to start the ads a few weeks before ballots go out. So Marshall Zellinger fired up the old truth test machine. Sometimes I ask my dad. Mayor Michael Hancock's first 2019 political ad features one of his daughters giving a brief history of his childhood. Been homeless in a motel room. The part of the ad will truth test comes after the biography. And he'll smile and he'll tell me how blessed he is to be mayor and get to help over 7,000 homeless people get housing. This number is accurate based on the city's Department of Human Services, but it needs plenty of context. Since July 2011, statistics from Denver DHS shows 7,500 homeless people getting permanent housing, not just overnight beds in a shelter. However, some of the people may be counted twice, depending on how they entered the housing programs. The 7,500 also counts runaways, who were only temporarily without a home. What may be the most important statistic is that these numbers do not reflect if the person becomes homeless again. And make rec centers free for kids who grow up like he did. This is true, but you should know it also required approval by Denver City Council and then Denver voters. In 2012, 73% of Denver voters approved 2A, which dealt with Tabor. It allowed the city to keep property tax revenue over the limit that existed under state law. In part, it promised to pay for 100 new police officers and firefighters, repave streets, keep libraries open longer, and yes, allow kids ages 5 to 18 access to the city's rec centers for free. Now you've seen a lot of our truth tests, so you're probably wondering, wait a minute, I didn't see that bitmoji where you got the thumbs down or it's called false. Not every truth test we do is going to be about ads that are false. And Kyle, I think it's important. You can have a positive ad that tells the truth, but you leave out context, and that's what this truth test is about. The things that are not said in that 30-second ad. Yeah. He 
he stuck to some pretty safe territory there where he knew that he wasn't going to get, you know, a big red flag. And it's also timely territory because mm -hmm. we'll be voting on something called Initiative 300 in Denver, which deals with homelessness and where the homeless are allowed to stay. I think it's by design. He's talking about success by putting homeless in homes instead of allowing them to stay on the streets. Because the mayor is aligned with the business community on this, wants to continue to restrict where homeless people can sleep in the city. He's on the opposite side of a lot of advocates on Correct. this. All right, Marshall, thank you. Organizers of the self-proclaimed official recall against Governor Jared Polis have booted one of their leaders for anti-Semitic Facebook posts following our report on this subject last night. Mandy Nelson, moderator of the Recall Colorado Governor Jared Polis Facebook group, which has nearly 30,000 members, wrote, quote, Coloradans, many of you heard again tonight on 9 News Next to Kyle Clark, we did have a person in the higher level of this organization who was found to have anti-Semitic posts on her personal Facebook page. She continues, quote, acts of anti-Semitism will not be tolerated and have never been accepted by this group. It is unfortunate that her past was not properly vetted before she was given her high profile role. I want to make clear here, the recall organizers might have seen the report on our air last night, but credit where credit is due. It was the original reporting of the Greeley Tribune's Tyler Sylvie, who we credited here last night. What I'm about to say is going to sound harsh and judgmental, mostly because it's harsh and judgmental. The new state logo unveiled today is kind of a mess, but you know what? It's cool because apparently designing it didn't cost us any extra and it replaces the $2.4 million dumpster fire of a state logo that former Governor John Hickenlooper gave us. Governor Polis doesn't usually wear a suit or a ski hat in a suit, but today was special. Uh, we are excited about this new branding opportunity for our state. Special because Polis unveiled the new Colorado logo. And before you say, hey, that thing's kind of like a bright multicolored mess. The state says it was free, all right? We really going to complain? If you're tempted to say, maybe we could have gotten a better one if we spent a little. Well, then I present you the old Colorado logo. The Hickenlooper administration spent $2.4 million to come up with that thing that looks like a hazmat warning or a carbon monoxide alert. So, you know what? Free 99 for the one on the right sounds just fine. Now, listen, Polis didn't ask my opinion, but if Colorado's ever looking for a new logo, this one's smoking hot, and I'm pretty sure it's free. Put it on everything. Oh, wait, we already do. There are businesses in Castle Rock that are outstanding in their field. They stand in the middle of a field where a man is helping to run some unique businesses from the beds of trucks. Our Byron Reed has the story. Let's take a look at what we built. Michael Ring is an entrepreneur. And I run a company called Cleantech, Hempex, and Front Range Fungi. And has seen his business grow from the ground up. To see it working at scale as a business and as a, as a collaborative thing has been a very cool experience for me as the designer and inventor of the whole entire business model. Badged authorization. Ring and his partners cultivate hemp and exotic mushrooms in Castle Rock. Out of the bed of several semi-trucks, parked in a field. About three years ago, we had the idea of converting semi-trailers into digital agriculture machines. They are heavily insulated right out of the gate. Um, they are perfect little bubbles. Um, it takes very little to keep them hot or cold. The company says the trailers are ideal for the plants and mushrooms, producing enough product to keep up with the demand. We have uh, working relationships with some restaurants um, up in Denver, and we have some markets. We have some food trucks that are using our shiitakes. These become uh, blue oyster mushrooms. Ring says the trailers run on electricity and water, a process that hasn't been that easy. We've had difficulty getting water to this site. The water main is 1,000 feet away. So this is our 275 gallon freshwater only tank. So he's having to truck the water in from his own house to make sure the business stays afloat. The policy here is development pays for development and so either I put in the $80,000 to get a water main here or I keep trucking in my water. Ring hopes his business model gives some ideas for other designers. This is enough to do about a quarter acre to flourish and think outside the box. This is a type of business that belongs in a factory in a warehouse and you know all the rest of that but that wasn't the hand that I was dealt. For next I'm Byron Reed. Hmm. That was pretty interesting. Hmm. Steve Steger joins me now to resolve an important issue of accuracy that came up in last night's program. The term legal beagle. Legal legal. Anyway, Kyle and I hoped you'd get to, we'd get to the bottom of this with your help. 
of which term is correct. Legal Eagle, obviously. It's totally legal. Anyway, this prompted a lot of feedback. A decent amount of You're feedback. You're being argumentative. There was a lot of feedback from you, but no resolution. Many of you were convinced it's legal beagle. Others of you were wrong. Merriam-Webster says that legal eagle was first used in 1869, which was a long time ago, Steve. But us young people use Wiktionary, which says legal beagle dates back to 1921. So it wasn't a Snoopy reference, all you haters out there. Steve, focus. Our goal here, our shared goal, is to be accurate. And it appears that it is accurate to say both legal eagle and legal beagle. And they both mean the, mean the exact same thing. A smart, dogged attorney. Dogged. So it's Beagle. No, stop that. We have agreed that we are going to set aside our differences being friends. And on the advice of our station's attorney, our legal Eagle. Or Beagle, if you prefer. Bold, strong, powerful. The coffee and the women and girls serving it. It's important to expose girls, especially to areas of kind of non-traditional career or non-traditional opportunity. So how do I say this? The bald eagle who lost her lifelong mate, then quickly replaced him with a younger man? She might have ended up with a bit of a mooch. That's next. Ah, uh, springtime in Colorado. We can go from sunshine and 70s to snow in a matter of hours, or in this case, a couple of days. Our high today at DIA 71, above the average of 57, and we'll go even warmer tomorrow, even with all the high cloud cover coming in ahead of a Pacific storm system that promises to bring showers on Thursday and maybe a rain-snow mix as early as Friday afternoon. Powerful cold front coming in, but between now and then, southwest winds ahead of that Pacific system will bring us sunshine and above average readings. The system to the the West will come in in two pieces. The first one Thursday, the stronger, colder one on Friday. Partly cloudy, dry and cool tonight. Low 42, sunny and 73 tomorrow. We are still mild on Thursday with a late day shower or storm and then a rain snow mix Friday ending Saturday morning. The weekend is cool and dry with 40 on Saturday afternoon and low to mid 50s for Sunday and for Monday. Kyle, Kathy, thank you. Welcome to today's edition of As the Nest Turns. The saga of that widowed bald eagle near Littleton, the one that we first told you about when she lost her lifelong mate in the blizzard, only to have a new, younger man show up in her nest within a week. Well, it is possible that the new guy who swooped in might just be using her as a meal ticket. 
A wildlife photographer who watched the original pair of bald eagles, as did many people in that community, tipped us off to the new guy hanging around. Colorado Parks and Wildlife workers told us it's not typical that the female eagle would find a new mate that quickly, but it is possible. Here's one theory. Because the new guy appears to be one to three years old, there's a chance. Hold on. It's her kid literally coming back to the nest so mom can make him dinner. They do mate for life, but when one dies off, um, they will go out and find a new mate. So um, it could happen either way. There could be a new mate or it could be one of the juveniles in there. It's not uncommon for the young of the bald eagles from maybe the previous year to come back and be in the nest. Could be hanging around because they're familiar. Um, you know, they could be going back to the same nest looking for food again. So maybe we misread some body signals. I, I'm not sure. Here's what happens. We watch and we wait. If they are not mates, she'll eventually kick him out because even if he's related, he could be a threat to her hatchlings. If he is some new beau, she'll keep him around for the next mating season. Women's History Month is about looking back at women who have made history and those who are making it still today. An organization in Denver is made up of those women who are empowering a new generation of girls through new business. Here's our Chris Nagiri. For many of us, it's the sound and smell that gets our day started. Double espresso. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is our 12 ounce right here. For 19 year old Laila Johnson, it's something she's grown sure. up with. I'm Native American, and the key thing about Natives is we love our coffee. So I've been, I've been born with coffee just always being brewed. I love the smells. I know how to make it, just don't like drinking it. Yes, you heard that right. Uh, it's a guessing game. Yes. Yeah. A barista that doesn't like her own product. I'm slowly getting addicted just because I have to stay up all night for those papers. In between her college classes, Leila works here at Strong, Smart and Bold Beans, a coffee shop that's run and fueled by the girls of Girls Inc. Metro Denver. When we started the coffee shop, it began as just a small project in front of our building. Girls were selling coffee from a plastic six foot table to parents dropping their daughters off in the summer program, and it has evolved into this full fledged coffee shop. Sonia Ulabari, president and CEO of Girls Inc. says the more the shop flourishes, the bigger the impact. We're able to employ more girls. We're able to provide more wages into the hands of our community members. Medium latte and then double espresso. And teaching these girls more than Thank just you. how to make a latte. It's important to expose girls, especially to areas of kind of non-traditional career or non-traditional opportunity. Thinking about how they aspire to be business owners, how they aspire, aspire to innovate, um, to bring new products to the market and to run and lead from small businesses to big companies. Giving them the ability to actually envision that as a real possibility for their future. It's really helped guide me. I've met a lot of great mentors. I have become mentors to people and I'm just really happy that I was able to be a part of Girls Inc. Because when girls are empowered to be strong, smart and bold, they can do anything. Latte. I was Kristen Aguirre reporting. Last year, they employed 10 girls as baristas at that location at Steam on the Platte. Find a phone, feed a family, a sign that one good deed can lead to another. And how did we end up with like three or four bird stories in this newscast? It's the same pair of birds that come back year and year. So it's like uh, watching a, a TV drama. A drama that also stars humans when Nest returns.
This is now a newscast that only covers bird stories. We had a good run. You know what else had a good run? Boulder County's live Osprey cam. But then the humans couldn't behave themselves in the comment section. Humans ruin everything. Here's Noel Brennan. This is Cattail Pond. We've seen um, bald eagles. We saw the great horned owl. Um, we've got all of the geese down here at this pond, a lot of other birds. You could call him an expert observer. Yeah, so nature. <laughs> but Nick Brockman doesn't pretend to be an animal expert. I don't. <laughs> I am not a wildlife biologist by any means. Uh, I manage the, the website for Parks and Open Space. Um, and that also includes taking care of this camera. That little black bubble beside the nest has a better view than even the longest lens. She's not full frame in this lens, but she's fairly close. She is the most famous resident. That's your osprey. Of Cattail Pond. So right now it looks like she's just hanging out on the perch. Boulder County installed the live nest cam eight years ago. So we've got over 25,000 comments right now. It's the most popular page on the site. I got an email from somebody in New Zealand who watches the camera all over the world. Thousands glued to this natural drama. A great horned owl attacked the female osprey on Sunday night. She survived as she did that lightning strike that fried the camera. What's great is people still can come out here and, and watch and actually see what's going on. If you don't know how to shoot, at least you can binge watch a bird. Season one to season eight and uh, seeing what's going to happen this year. For next, I'm Noel Brennan. There's a link to that Osprey cam on 9news.com. The link when next returns is between one good deed and another. It is a sign that I promise will make you smile. It's a sign 
that kindness is contagious. Next viewer, Dylan Sarnelli spotted a sign attached to a bench in Berkeley Park. A thank you note to a person who found a cell phone and turned it into the rec center. The phone's owner left the sign saying that he or she donated to the Food Bank of the Rockies in honor of someone's honesty. That's good stuff. And we love Dylan's dog in the photo as well. Donna Keeley writes in, I know some folks will think changing the state logo is an impeachable offense for the governor, but I love it. Who would think that? Oh, wait, here's Bonnie saying the state is not his and it's the people's let us vote on the logo. Good grief. Hey, a note from Summit County. Maggie says we have no illegal beagles in Eagle. That's good. I'll see you next time.